Today, after days of protest by an unprecedented number of Egyptians, a nation at the very heart of the Arab Spring, where 60 years of authoritarian rule came crumbling down on all our television sets, bringing about a democratically elected government. Today, the nation of Egypt is once again threatening to explode into chaos. The current president, Mohamed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood, defied a military ultimatum, a Wednesday deadline given by the commander of Egypt's armed forces, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, to resolve the political standoff or face the military's own roadmap toward a solution. In a lengthy televised statement, President Morsi angrily said he will not step down and that we protect his constitutional legitimacy with his life. Morsi said, quote, there is no substitute for legitimacy. But today, opponents of the elected Muslim Brotherhood government called their supporters to the streets yet again, and they came by the millions, largely dwarfing counter-protesters who were called out in support of Morsi's government. Today's protest featured a laser light show, which oftentimes displayed words in English about what protesters hope is Morsi's imminent ouster. This all takes place just two days after what some are calling the largest mass protests in human history. An estimated 14 million people taking the streets in a country of 84 million people. President Obama traveling in Africa was once again put in the position of deciding whether to pick a side or hold back and let this very uncertain process unfold even after Secretary of State John Kerry last month approved $1.3 billion in annual U.S. military aid to Egypt. President Obama has called President Morsi, urging him to listen to the voices of all Egyptians. So we're going to continue to work with all parties inside of Egypt to try to channel this through legal, legitimate uh, processes. Our position's always been, it's not our job to choose who Egypt's leaders are. We do want to make sure that all the voices are heard uh, and it's done uh, in a peaceful way. Now with Morsi saying he's staying put and protesters still in the streets, all eyes are on the military to see just what happens next. NBC News foreign correspondent Eamon Moheldin is live tonight in Cairo with the latest. Eamon, there was a lot of concern today, I think, about violence on the streets when both sides, opposition protesters and pro-Muslim Brotherhood uh, supporters, had called to be on the streets. Uh, what played out on the streets uh, in Egypt today? Well, there have been a few different pockets of protests taking place across the capital and other parts of the country. In Cairo itself, the main anti-Morsi protest has been in Tahrir Square. There's been one also outside the presidential palace. And in another part of town, the supporters of President Mohamed Morsi have held their own rallies. Now, in and around the areas between these two uh, major gatherings, there have been skirmishes. In fact, Ministry of Health officials this evening say there have already been at least three people killed killed in clashes outside of Cairo University. Now, at Cairo University, there was a group of uh, protesters who were actually in support of President Morsi. They are alleging that police did not protect them from attacks uh, carried out by thugs. And so, in the last couple hours, particularly since the end of President Mohamed Morsi's speech, there has been an uptick in violence that many people feel are as a result of the building tensions in these final hours before the ultimatum. The ultimatum, uh, which the the, the military has issued, I would even say, not uh, with authoritatively, but on somewhat dubious authority, other than the fact they are the military. This ultimatum they've issued, my understanding is that it, it expires around 10 or 11 a.m. our time tomorrow morning. What are people anticipating in the next 12 to 24 hours? Well, at this particular point, we really have no clear indication what is going to happen. Local Egyptian media with sources in the military have been suggesting that the military has already prepared this roadmap. The roadmap would involve a series of short-term and long-term steps. Among the short-term steps would be the announcement that the Constitution has been suspended, that the parliament will be dissolved, and that elections in the long run would be held. Now, to get the government back up and functioning, a caretaker prime minister would be appointed, perhaps one from the military, an officer perhaps, or certainly somebody the military approves of that would be made up mostly of a technocratic government. They would then be responsible for running the day-to-day -day affairs of the country while a committee of experts prepares a new constitution that would then pave the way for presidential and parliamentary elections. What would happen to President Mohamed Morsi? What would happen to senior members of the Muslim Brotherhood Freedom and Justice Party? What would happen to the political opposition and these protests? All of those questions remain 
remain unclear. We do know that the military has deployed some additional resources on the streets. There are more police present in and around areas that could be possible flashpoints, including the large protest. But as of right now, nobody has a clear indication what will happen once that ultimatum is actually reached at 4 p.m. local time. And as you mentioned, uh, around 10 a.m. Eastern time. Amen. When the first round of protest broke out that uh, ended up ousting Mubarak from power, there was a broad perception, my understanding from my reporting, there's a broad perception the U.S. was very slow to back the protesters that essentially stood with Mubarak. What is the perception now, given the very carefully parsed statement of the president today, what is the perception there about where the U.S. is in this particular uh, standoff? If you were to ask those in Tahrir Square, those that have been campaigning against President Morsi, there is no mistake about it. The United States has once again stood with the wrong leader in mm. this equation. For the past year, many people have been criticizing how the United States has systematically warmed up to the Muslim Brotherhood. More so in recent days, ahead of this big protest on Sunday, the United States ambassador here in Cairo, Ann Patterson, made some very controversial remarks that angered a lot of Egyptian local media saying that the protests were not necessarily going to amount to anything. In fact, many people interpreted her comments as lending legitimacy to the presidency of Mohamed Morsi, saying he was democratically elected, but more importantly, he was capable of getting the job done. And so a lot of local media took her to task. More so, our, more so the protesters and activists have been very critical in terms of how the United States has not exercised more influence mm -hmm. over the course of the last year in trying to make sure this country takes proper transitions to democracy. NBC's Amen Moheldin, thank you so much. Is this how Egypt is going to change presidents? Every time there's a president that you're not happy with, protests are going to come out and you're going to kick him out? No, hopefully we'll have a proper constitution and the proper uh, parliament that will give us the democratic means of impeaching such president if that event may occur in the future but right now the country is built on no foundations and a president that is doing a very bad job so you don't have a democratic means of impeaching this president right now so this is all we have I was an Egyptian protester speaking with NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel. Joining me now is Mona El Tahawe, an Egyptian activist and columnist, and Samar Shahata, an associate professor of Middle Eastern politics at the University of Oklahoma. Mona, I want to start with you. You're living in Egypt now. You've been very involved in the protests from the beginning. Uh, what gets 14 million people in the streets? Like, why is everyone so angry? And why, and maybe this shows my own ignorance, but it seems kind of all of a sudden that this has sparked. Explain to me why, why we saw such a galvanized action. Basically and quite simply, Mohamed Morsi has spent the past year since he was elected as president during this transitional period of delegitimizing himself at every step. Last November, he assumed tremendous powers for himself that allowed him to rush through a constitution that is utterly horrendous and, and incredibly unfair to the revolution and the Egyptians who paid with their lives for this revolution. And then he's also consistently attacked his, his opponents. He sent to jail or sent into uh, question or detention uh, activists. He's even hounded comedians like Bassem Youssef, who's often described as the John Stewart of, e of Egypt. And he's also made it almost impossible for us to find any other way to protest than this. Now, he was voted in by 13, one, three million votes, but you have an extra one million against him in the street. That's which crazy. says to me, exactly, which says to me, Egyptians, just like this young man said, because we don't have institutional means of impeaching him, the economy is on the brink of collapse, unemployment is terrible, torture is more now under Morsi than it was under Mubarak. So we're looking at him saying, how can you help us in this transition. All right, so Samir, here, here is where I, I'm watching this unfold and I've been reading about it and watching it very compelled. And I feel quite torn uh, because at one level I have zero love for the Muslim Brotherhood or for Mohamed Morsi and everything that Mona just said about the way he's acted as a kind of quasi authoritarian figure. At the same time, it does seem to me maybe not the greatest thing for the development of Egyptian democracy for the first democratically elected government to collapse under in within a year under threat of essentially a military coup. How should I be feeling about this as an American liberal watching this unfold? I want someone to tell me who's side I should be on uh, as I watch for this outcome. 
Well, I think your emotions are, are spot on. I mean, clearly the side that you should be on is the side of the people in the popular will, and I think that is demonstrated in the people in Tahrir protesting, as well as the people protesting in front of the presidential palace. But your torn, ambivalent feelings are correct, because here we have a paradox. We have a supposedly democratic movement calling for the military to intervene to oust a democratically elected president in order to restore Egypt on the right path to democracy. So clearly there are some difficulties here and the difficulty is not only with the idea that Morsi might be removed, but then what happens to the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups in the future? Now I share Muna's feelings completely with regard to Morsi's abysmal leadership and presidency. And she also mentioned that the economy has deteriorated, there are daily fuel shortages, electricity outages, and he's done none of the things that he promised to do. Uh, at the same time, however, you cannot exclude any significant element of the population that is willing to participate in formal politics. So I, I, you remember what happened in Algeria, not that that's going to happen in Egypt, but when a military um, uh, pushed aside democratically elected Islamists, the Islamic Salvation Front, that led to a civil war of horrific proportions. Right. That's not going to happen in Egypt. but. Another difficulty is how do you integrate this group, the Muslim Brotherhood, into, into the body politic? Right. So, so here is what I have kept thinking about is I would not want to be the person who wakes up every morning with the Egypt portfolio for the U.S. government. And if, you, if I could get in a time machine right now and talk to some Americans in 2003 and said, check this out, in 10 years the U.S. government will be viewed by much of the most populous Arab nation in the world as being excessively close to the political Islam party, you would be like, oh, are you out of your mind? And yet somehow it is now perceived mm -hmm. that the U.S. and the Muslim Brotherhood of all people are in bed together. Uh, it is hugely ironic, but and I spoke on a panel with Madeleine Albright and Richard Haas from the Council on Foreign Relations a couple of days ago. And, you know, this word, this horrible word stability kept coming up. And the U.S. administration and the people who advise the U.S. administration cannot get over this fact that the stability must not come at the expense of the people. So 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I would have told the U.S. administration, make sure that there's enough space in the middle for people who are not either the military or the Muslim Brotherhood to be the only two powers in the country. And that space in the middle is the people, because we are now the third point of that triangle. And the military must understand the people will not allow a return to military rule. So then, Summer, what, what is, what, if you could sit down with the president for 15 minutes and tell him how to play the next 12 hours, I mean, it, it seems like a real difficult thing to navigate. What would your advice be? Well, it's clearly a difficult position. I think the first thing that Mr. Obama has to realize is that the United States' influence on Egypt and on other countries in the region is significantly less than it was before. In the past, it was simply a phone call to an autocrat who was unaccountable. Now, that's not the case. Egyptians and Tunisians and Yemenis and so on are making their own history. So the United States is not as powerful as it was, once was. And secondly, I think Mr. Obama hasn't, and Mona pointed this out uh, earlier, hasn't put enough pressure on Mr. Morsi up until this point to behave in, in a democratic fashion. Mm. So clearly he needs to be putting pressure on Mr. Morsi, but he also needs to be telling the Egyptian military that receives $1.3 billion of American largesse every year that, that, that we, should, we will not tolerate what we saw before with regard to autocratic politics and the military's involvement in domestic affairs. There needs to be some process that produces civilian, democratic, pluralist politics where all Egyptians are equal, regardless of gender, religion, and so on. S Summer, what you just said right there, your two-pronged answer, is precisely the contradiction I always hear. Point one, the U.S. has to recognize it has less influence. Point two, the U.S. needs to exert pressure <laughs> to make sure this outcome happens, and it seems like that is precisely the knot we face here as we watch the countdown towards the ultimatum tomorrow morning. Egyptian activist Mona El Tahawi here with me at the table. Samer Shahata from the University of Oklahoma. Thank you both. That is all in for